The Avengers. That's what we call ourselves. Sort of like a team. Earth's mightiest heroes type thing. Avengers, time to work for a living. That's my secret. I'm always angry. I am on the side of life. You get hurt, hurt them back. You get killed, walk it off. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. I'm your host, Andrew, and I'm here to talk to you about the Avengers. Welcome to episode 66 of Some Assembly Required, your weekly adventure into the annals of Earth's mightiest heroes, the Avengers. This week, we are taking a look at Avengers number 61. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. This issue is written by Roy Thomas, pencils by John Buscema, inks by George Klein, letters by Sam Rosen, and it comes to us in February of 1969. Starting off the bat, this is one epic cover. There's a giant ice monster, a giant fire monster, which are both fitting given the issue title, and they are battling it out with the Avengers, Black Knight, and Doctor Strange. There is a lot of action going on in this cover, a lot of very bright colors against the black background, which I like given the fact that we have the ice monster filling a significant portion of the page, and a white background would have looked really terrible with that ice monster front and center on the cover. So moving inside, not only do we get one opening splash page, but we get two. And this is to allow for a very large display of the issue title. So we get the first half, some say the world will end in fire on the first page, and then the second half, some say in ice on the second page. And of course, appropriately, the fire monster that we see is on the first page fighting with Hawkeye and Black Knight and the ice monster is on the second page fighting against Vision and Black Panther. Again, all of this is very representative of what we are going to see in the issue. They're also both really great examples of John Buscema's art and they really feel like extensions of the cover, which I don't necessarily consider a bad thing. Both pages are totally on theme for the issue title and for the portion of the page that they represent. All said and done, these are really great pages that really fit the book we're about to read. So the fact that we spent an extra page on a second opening title splash page, I'm okay with. We start our issue finding several of the Avengers in the basement of Avengers Mansion running what amounts to an experiment on Vision. Really, what they're trying to do is help Vision recharge by firing a beam of rays at Vision's forehead and allowing the small jewel-shaped spot on his forehead to absorb the solar rays. This is how Vision replenishes his energy supply. Unlike in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where the the jewel on Vision's forehead is in fact the Mind Stone. In the comic universe, Vision does not have any of the Infinity Gems, though the Soul Gem is kept in a very similar manner on the forehead of Adam Warlock, though that will definitely be for a different podcast episode. Or you can go back and check out my live panel from Tidewater Comic Con from about two years ago, where I did a brief history of the Infinity Gems, and I talk about Adam Warlock and the Soul gem at length. So as the Avengers are kind of wrapping up this experiment, they are interrupted and to an extent greeted by the astral projection form of Doctor Strange. Now, it's worth taking a moment here to discuss that Doctor Strange's appearance is for lack of a better term, strange, compared to what we have seen him even as recently as last issue. At this particular moment, although again he is in his astral form, Doctor Strange has a costume that is reminiscent of his normal costume, but is far more akin to a standard superhero costume, including a mask. Now, I thought this was originally just due to the fact that it was his astral projection and it was John Buscema's take on that astral projection. But as it turns out, in between last issue where we saw Doctor Strange in his normal attire at the wedding of Wasp and Yellowjacket, and this issue where we see him in the more superhero designed costume, there have actually been four issues of Doctor Strange's own title, and specifically in Doctor Strange 177, Doctor Strange gets a new costume. And we'll see that new costume in its entirety in a few pages when Doctor Strange returns his astral form to his body, but 
but this is basically what it looks like minus the color scheme. One last side note, and that is that, as I mentioned, the change takes place in Doctor Strange 177, and it's worth noting that Doctor Strange's street address is 177A Bleecker Street. I don't think it was a necessarily a decision specifically for issue 177, let's do something cool and different, but it's an interesting fact that it happens on that issue number for a number that actually has meaning for the character. In his astral form, Doctor Strange informs the Avengers that he is in need of their help. And he asks that the Avengers come with him so that he can explain what's going on. So the Avengers load up into their aircraft and they follow the astral form of Doctor Strange to a graveyard where they see the astral form of Doctor Strange rejoin with his body and enter into a crypt. And within this crypt, they find the unconscious body of Black Knight. So seeing their unconscious, sometimes ally, Black Knight on the floor, the Avengers begin to wonder what happened, and Doctor Strange goes on to explain that in Doctor Strange's most recent issue, 178, he and Black Knight faced off against the Sons of Satanish, which they're guys dressed up in red devil costumes, calling themselves the Son of Satanish. Like, really? That's a little on point. I get it's the 1960s and you gotta get it through the comic code, so you've gotta make little changes so it doesn't look like they're actually devil worshippers. I get it, but the red costumes and everything else... I mean, it's even got like giant bat ears that kind of look like horns. It's really on point. But anyways, Black Knight helps Doctor Strange take on the Sons of Satanish. But one of them uses what is referred to as the Crystal of Conquest. And he intends to use it on Doctor Strange to injure Doctor Strange in some fashion. But instead, Black Knight jumps in front of the blast and he takes the, the hit that was meant for Doctor Strange. Of course, from there, Doctor Strange then confronts the son of Satanish, takes the Crystal of Conquest, and goes to get the Avengers. Doctor Strange then tells the Avengers that the world is in peril and that this crystal is their only hope. But here, more than anything else, the world is their concern. Black Panther corrects Doctor Strange and he says, our sole concern after the Black Knight. Now, I love the empathy towards Black Knight that Black Panther is showing, especially because Black Panther hasn't really spent a whole lot of time working with Black Knight. And actually, in reality, none of the Avengers have, right? Being the new Black Knight, Dane Whitman really has only interacted with the Avengers on a handful of occasions, all of which have happened within the last 10 issues or so. And while his intent is usually pretty good, Black Knight's execution has not always been spectacular. So he hasn't necessarily been the closest of allies with the Avengers, even though he's at least made a pretty sizable effort. So back at Avengers headquarters, the Avengers realize that, hey, Doctor Strange Strange has the title of doctor for a reason. It's because he's a really talented surgeon. You know, unlike most superheroes, Doctor Strange's secret identity is not really a secret. It's Doctor Strange. That's his actual name. I'm Peter, by the way. Doctor Strange. Oh, you're using your made-up names. Then I am Spider-Man. So the Avengers pressure Doctor Strange into operating on Black Knight to try and save his life. Now this is important because one of the reasons that Doctor Strange became the master of the magical arts that he is, is because he lost his abilities as a surgeon due to a car accident that damaged his hands. So it's questionable here whether or not Doctor Strange, in his current condition, would even be able to perform this operation. But he is willing to give it a try, no matter how bad Badly, his hands are shaking, which he definitely points out at one point. Whether it's out of fear or because of the accident, Strange is uncertain. But one way or the other, he does manage to successfully complete the surgery and save Black Knight's life. Though, weirdly enough here, Doctor Strange performs the surgery in his superhero costume. He dons gloves, a surgical mask, but keeps on his superhero costume and mask. It's really kind of weird, yet slightly amusing at the same time especially when he's got the mask on this one panel in particular he's got the mask with the blue like face mask and then the red of the cape behind him he actually reminds me quite a bit of spawn although obviously this predates spawn by a good 20 years it still definitely kind of looks like spawn so while black knight is starting to recover the other avengers who have been waiting patiently are greeted by vision 
who has come to tell them tales of a giant volcano that is starting to blaze to life in Antarctica. And as they further investigate, they find that Black Panther's home of Wakanda is being taken over by snow and ice. Obviously, both of these conditions are super weird. And as it turns out, this is what Doctor Strange was concerned about. Basically, we have had what amounts to an eight-page cold open to get us to the primary story. I will admit that this is kind of a risky decision on the part of Roy Thomas and John Buscema, where we don't really get down to the meat and potatoes of the story until page nine. But I kind of like it, because you get some necessary background information without it seeming overly forced. And if they jumped right into the adventure here, I think in order to get some of this backstory of the Sons of Satan-ish, the Crystal of Conquest, we would have had to kind of break up the action of the story, and I think that would have been detrimental to the issue. As it stands, now that we get into the, the heart of the issue, it's really kind of a, a sprint the rest of the way to the finish. It's, it's a very high energy, high impact story. So with this news, Doctor Strange points out that there are four of them ready to combat this problem, and then Black Knight who has recovered far more than really anyone else would under the circumstances, except for maybe another superhero, shows up and says, no, it's five people. So we've got two groups of two, and then Doctor Strange is going to kind of hang out back at Avengers Mansion and figure a few things out for a little while. So Black Knight and Hawkeye head towards Antarctica, and Black Panther and Vision mount up in their new Quinjet and head for Wakanda. And I am real quick super excited here because this is the first introduction of the Quinjet. Now we don't have any more aero cars or rocket ships or any of that nonsense. We now have a specifically Avengers mode of transportation. The X Men have the Blackbird, now the Avengers have their Quinjet. I am super happy. It's worth noting that the series Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes do go back and retcon the creation of the Quinjet to having at least begun as a prototype somewhere between issues five and six of Avengers. However, this is really the first time that we are going to see the Avengers take it into the field, and it's going to become their common mode of transportation from here out. So I'm very excited for the Quinjet. Also, now I don't have to try and remember the names of like dumb aircraft that they're using. I can now just say Quinjet. Also, I have a little bit of a, of a concern here, and that is apparently that Marvel writers have, have never played Dungeons & Dragons because splitting the party, especially a four-man party, which is a fairly standard adventuring group, is a terrible plan and usually ends up in a total party kill. Okay. To be fair, Dungeons & Dragons wasn't actually published until 1974, and even if you account for the fact that several rules versions have existed since 1970, this issue was published in 1969. But the premise is still sound. Split the party, you run a much higher risk of getting the whole party killed. And this almost happens. So in Wakanda, Vision and Black Panther figure out what's going on, and they find the ice giant Ymir. We're going to go with that. Y-M-I-R, Ymir. And Ymir is an Asgardian creature. He is a frost giant and he is one of the Jotuns. So as excited as I was to see the first Quinjet, literally on the same page, Vision and Black Panther crash it into Ymir in an attempt to destroy him. Unfortunately for them, Ymir reforms and begins his rampage once again. Off in Antarctica, Black Knight and Hawkeye run into Sartor. For those of you who have seen Thor Ragnarok, you will recognize Sartor as the giant hellfire demon from Thor Ragnarok, which destroys Asgard in the end. He, he's part of the Ragnarok prophecy. So both Ymir and Sartor are Jotun, and they both first appeared in Journey to Mystery 97. Now the Jotuns conceptually are similar to like the titans of Greek mythology, but they're, they're generally considered giants of some form. Remember Norse mythology? is full of characters that are giants. It's just kind of one of the things that they latched onto. And so the Jotuns are forms of giant. And in this case, both of them are pretty nasty. And to be fair here, it's a significant understatement to say that the Avengers are in over their heads. I mean, Black Knight and Hawkeye, who are probably the two least powered members of the Avengers currently, Hawkeye using a bow and arrow and Black Knight using some technology, are having to face off against a freaking fire demon. Like, what good are arrows and a lance that shoots 
different kinds of beams really going to be against an enemy like this? Now, needless to say, that doesn't stop the Avengers. And in fact, it doesn't stop Vision and Black Panther. Though I will say because Vision and Black Panther, specifically Vision, are more powerful, they tend to have a bit more success. Vision blasts Ymir with a lot of the energy he had stored up from the beginning of the issue. Black Panther hurls a heavy boulder on him. Generally speaking, they have a much higher degree of success than do the other Avengers against Sardar. Now, right about here is where we kind of start getting to the conclusion of the issue and Doctor Strange finally comes back in the picture having spent some time working on the Crystal of Conquest and he has determined that there is a way to reverse the spell which is causing all of this mayhem and so by executing this spell he manages to transport Ymir to Antarctica and at the exact same time both demons are pulling back in order to land devastating blows against their particular set of Avengers and they are transported in such a way that when they go to deliver these blows they crash into each other and the two forces fire and ice cancel one another out. This is where we will kind of wrap up our issue in that the spell having been canceled out, Doctor Strange in his astral form, because again, Doctor Strange is back in Manhattan still, greets the Avengers and basically explains that, hey, you know, we took care of business and thankfully only the Sons of Satanish were the ones who fell victim to this horrible outcome, that really they were the only ones bothered by it. So conceptually, I like the ending of this issue because it's very clever. Managing to transport Ymir to the same location as Sarder so that they counteract each other at just the right moment is a really great little piece of storytelling. Unfortunately, because it happens so close to the end of the issue, really in the last like two pages, and most of the action happens on the last page, the ending does feel a little bit like a non-ending. Like we just kind of wrap things up a little too quickly. If you remember way back when I used to have the same complaint about Don Heck's early issues, where he would wrap up the story, even if it was well done, it would just be a little bit too fast and the pacing didn't quite work out. So at the beginning of the issue, I talked about how much I liked having that second splash page. I think had they moved that second splash page to the scene where Ymir and Sardar cancel one another out, or if they just inserted an extra page there, it would have been, I think, just that little bit more that we needed. It would have provided one to two more panels of storytelling to finish wrapping up the issue, and it would have put a little bit more emphasis on that negation of the spell. Now, it's worth noting that next issue we're basically going to pick up where we leave the avengers here so although it is a separate story in and of itself it does kind of feel like a continuation of the same adventure and so by the end of the two issues it feels a little bit more tightly wrapped up but as a standalone issue this issue definitely could do with just a little bit of tweaking in terms of the timing to help give this story a little bit better pacing here at the end. One last little tidbit that I didn't find initially, so I'm, I'm actually adding this at the end of the episode after the fact, is that if you're interested in this kind of thing, you can actually find the Crystal of Conquest here in the real world. It is on display in the queue at Disney's California Adventure for the Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout Ride. The this is the reskinned ride of the Hollywood Tower of Terror at California Adventure. It's done in a Guardians of the Galaxy theme where the Guardians are trying to escape from the Collector. So this is an item that is part of the Collector's collection and you can see it as you pass through the queue. And I will try and go ahead and, and post some pictures on Facebook and Instagram of the item actually in the queue. I love it when they take little bits and pieces like this, things that aren't very well known and throw them into more public places like this. In the original Guardians of the Galaxy film, you had a lot of little bits and pieces of things like that in the collector's collection, like Adam Warlock's cocoon, which also happens to be on display, as well as Cosmo the dog. Remember, you can find us at AvengersAssembly.com, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and you can find this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, or YouTube. If you'd like to be a part of the conversation, send your questions and comments to Andrew at AvengersAssembly.com.
Before I talk about what we're going to look at next week, I did want to take a moment and talk about what's been going on with our website and with the podcast. As you may have noticed that although we are putting out new content, new episodes, I haven't been quite as consistent uh, in the last oh, week and a half to two weeks or so about getting stuff out. That is because I have been working very hard to catch up on the rest of the content that we have been behind on. So over the last probably two weeks and for the next, I think, week and a half to two weeks to come, I have been posting one per day the new pages for each episode. So each episode has a link to the podcast, it has the creative team listed. It has all of the Avengers and villains listed and a short plot summary of the issue, all for your browsing pleasure at AvengersAssembly.com. Additionally, all of the YouTube episodes are updating. Those are coming out at noon every day, every weekday, uh, until we are caught up, which should be sometime in the next two weeks. And I have been going back and updating all of our hero bios, and I will shortly be going to start updating all of our villain bios, which are so Sorely lacking. They have been very, very neglected, and I feel very terrible about that. I really do. Once I am caught up with that, I am looking forward to starting a very big project I am very excited about. I'm going to be working on a multi-part YouTube video history of the Infinity Gems. I had so much fun doing the panel at Tidewater Comic Con two years ago, and I loved reading all of those issues so much that I am going to take some time and do a more in-depth history of the the Infinity Gems. I'm going to break it down into, I think, six parts. Um, I'm not 100% certain on the breakdown of that just yet. I've got a, a rough idea of what I want to do, but I may make some alterations to it. There may be a seventh part. I don't know. We'll see. But I am very excited about that. That is a big project for me, so it's going to take some time. Please bear with me while I work on it. I promise you the end result will be spectacular. Now... Next week, we are going to be taking a look at Avengers number 62, The Monarch and the Man-Ape. All right, hey. All right, good job, guys. Uh, let's just not come in tomorrow. Let's just take a day. Have you ever tried shawarma? There's a shawarma joint about two blocks from here. I don't know what it is, but I want to try it. <laughs>